Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Jack Reitrick, and I'm a pediatric cardiologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Welcome to Pediatric and Congenital Heart Talks, a series of lecture presentations and discussions on interesting and important topics in our field of pediatric and congenital heart care. In this series, we will share insights on a variety of topics, offer new perspectives on some basic principles, introduce novel concepts and innovations, as well as identify what needs to come next to solve challenging problems in our field. Our objectives are to provide education on a variety of topics, but also perhaps to stimulate some provocative thought on your part. We'd love to hear from you and to get your questions and thoughts on these discussions. You can contact us at this email address, chopheartalks at email.chop.edu. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Jonathan Chen. I'm chief of the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. On behalf of all of us here, welcome to Pediatric and Congenital Heart Talks. In this next section, we'll be very fortunate to speak a little bit with uh, Dr. Matt Jolly, who is uh, a true MVP in our field. He's been trained in both cardiology and in anesthesiology. He wears both hats on a daily basis, and he's someone we rely on very, very uh, heavily as surgeons because he helps us in all these different venues. Uh, Matt also uh, has a very active laboratory uh, that's investigating the mechanisms of pediatric heart valve disease. He is an assistant professor in the Division of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine. And today, Matt's going to be speaking to us about a different take on the terminology of precision medicine. And this is looking at precision medicine as it pertains to our field uh, in helping us to understand specific patients' valvular heart pathology. And in that sense, also understanding uh, other interventions that we can develop or, or, or uh, implement uh, to address these problems. So, Matt Jolly. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I have no disclosures. 3D echocardiography has dramatically transformed our understanding of normal and abnormal mitral valve structure in adults. For example, 3D echocardiography showed that the normal mitral annulus is not flat. Engineering simulations performed over a decade ago then suggested that the mitral valve's non-planar Pringles potato chip structure may be important to reducing stress on the valve leaflets. There are now numerous commercial software packages for evaluating the structure of the mitral valve, and they are being applied to bring further insight to clinical questions. Accordingly, a recent review by Feroz Mahmood suggested that a quantitative 3D approach to valve assessment was both feasible and necessary. Specifically, he said, given this context, echocardiographers may be expected to diagnose and quantify valve dysfunction, assess suitability for repair, and determine the success or failure of the repair procedure. Cumulatively, 3D-based findings have led to tailored surgical interventions, such as non-planar aneoplasty rings and increasingly transcatheter interventions based on 3D structural knowledge of the mechanisms of valve dysfunction. As the number of potential interventions and approaches increases, it is going to be very difficult to decide what intervention is best for an individual patient. In a recent review, engineer Michael Sachs suggested, there is now agreement that adjunctive procedures are required to treat valve disease. However, there is no consensus regarding the best procedure. Given the number of proposed procedures and the complexity and duration of such studies, it is highly unlikely that valve procedure optimization will be achieved by prospective clinical trials. There is thus an urgent need for physiologically based quantitative assessments of valve function to better design surgical solutions and associated therapies. We often think of precision medicine in terms of genetics or pharmacotherapies, but in our field, many of the interventions we provide to help children are structural. In that context, image-based patient-specific modeling becomes a type of precision medicine. So where are we in pediatrics? There are a significant number of children and young adults affected by valve disease. For example, atrioventricular valve failure is common in single ventricle patients, particularly when there is a single right ventricle and a tricuspid valve, or 
a atrioventricular canal valve present. And when atrioventricular valve failure is present, failure of the single ventricle circulation is much more likely as shown in red. Furthermore, durability of atrioventricular valve repair in this population in the current era is relatively poor. Switching gears, repair of complete atrioventricular canal is another common procedure in pediatrics. Initial surgical mortality is low, but the need for reintervention on the left side of the valve approaches 30%. The repair type doesn't seem to influence outcomes, and outcomes have not improved significantly over the last 20 years. In a recent study at CHOP, they found that nearly 40% of complete atrioventricular canal patients had moderate or greater AVVR early after repair, and nearly as many with late AVVR, even after intervention. Further, nearly a third of those with trivial left AVVR early in their postoperative course developed significant left AVVR. This is a common finding across multiple institutions and internationally. Kaza et al. put it well in 2012 when they stated, the observation that different surgical techniques are not associated with different outcomes reinforces the fact that we do not completely understand the pathophysiology of the complete atrioventricular canal as it um, relates to remodeling and late postoperative function. These are just a couple examples of a diverse and heterogeneous population of children and young adults with valve disease. And given the diversity of the population and relatively small size, it is even more unlikely that procedural optimization will be achieved by prospective clinical trials in children compared to adults. As such, to echo Dr. Sox, there's an urgent need for improved means to optimally match the optimal intervention to an individual child to do better than guess and check. So how are we going to actualize this call to deliver image-based precision medicine to children with valve disease? In order to push the field forward, we will need high quality images and customized analytics. Here at CHOP, we can do TE like in the adults, but 3D TE probes can currently only be inserted into children over about 20 kilos. What about transthoracic in these smaller children who form the primary cohort of our interest? Here we demonstrate quality images of a tricuspid valve in a, by transthoracic echo in a child with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And another hypoplastic tricuspid valve which shows a very different valve morphology. We can image the complete atrioventricular canal before repair, as well as examine the left valve and complete atrioventricular canal after repair, as in this child with prolapse of the surgically created anterior life anterior like leaflet shown by the red arrow from the left atrial and left ventricular view. So we can generate adequate images, but how are we going to quantitate the structure, better understand valve mechanics, and take the next step toward informing valve repair? For relatively normal pediatric mitral valves, commercial packages can be utilized, and structure does seem to matter. For example, children with Marfan syndrome are susceptible to mitral valve prolapse and regurgitation. We quantified differences in billow, shown in red, relative to normal controls, and found that children with Marfan syndrome had more billow and flatter annuli than normal children, similar to adults with degenerative mitral valve disease. This finding may have implications for following these children over time, and when needed, could provide important information to guide surgical repair. But many of the valves we are most interested in in our field are not mitral valves, and currently there are no commercial tools to evaluate them. The group in Edmonton has been trailblazers in this arena and have several papers now describing the tricuspid valve and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. For example, in the top row, they show a neonate with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and very little tenting volume. In the bottom row, they show a neonate with HLHS and significant tenting volume, or what they call tethering volume. Children with greater tenting volume prior to stage one had more TR and decreased survival relative to those with less tenting volume. In other words, in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the 3D structure of the tricuspid valve before any intervention is associated with survival. 
The same group recently described increased billow and annular dilation in hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients with Glenn physiology and tricuspid regurgitation, essentially the opposite of what is seen in that high-risk neonatal pre-stage one cohort. These differences by the same group in mechanism of tricuspid valve dysfunction in a population over the period of less than a year strongly suggest that the mechanism of dysfunction may vary not only across individuals, but also with age and stage of repair. They also noted that Glenn patients with more laterally directed papillary muscles seemed to have more TR, but this, was not, but this qualitative observation was not statistically significant in their cohort. However, in our recent study in older hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients with a Fontan circulation, a more laterally directed anterior papillary muscle angle was clearly associated with moderate or greater tricuspid regurgitation, again, highlighting changes in mechanism with growth and time. And can this be intervened upon? Perhaps in an ex vivo porcine model of papillary muscle redirection, they're able to reduce TR more than annuloplasty alone. This approach has been described clinically in a small series in Boston, and we've also seen anecdotal success here at CHOP. Further, in early results, we can see differences in leaflet structure in the hypoplastic left heart syndrome Fontan population with increased billow and regurgitant valves similar to what Cohen et al. saw in their Glenn population. Right now, this modeling is likely too slow for broad clinical application. However, ongoing development of automation based on machine learning and statistical shape analysis may allow rapid modeling and precise quantification of dysfunctional valve um, parameters which differ from normal valves across multiple axes. That structural valve profile for an individual can then be contextualized within the spectrum of anatomy and function we see in a given congenital population. We are working on many of these technologies here at CHOP and have some promising progress. But how are we going to translate this information into actual repairs? We have demonstrated image-derived physical valve modeling as demonstrated in a tricuspid valve model here. You can directly 3D print or make a 3D printed mold to fabricate a tricuspid valve based on image-derived information. And the resulting models can then be used to practice surgical repairs, exemplified here with a de Vega annuloplasty on a tricuspid valve. One limitation is that you cannot test the results of your repair. How can you take it one step further to see if your repairs actually work? We work with Robarts to investigate this possibility for the adult mitral valve. We shared our modeling tools and they brought fabrication and mechanical engineering to the problem. They developed a method for integrating the valve models into a simulation based on a fluid pulse generator to mimic ventricular contraction, complete with the ability to perform TE on the beating model. Here's an example with an adult mitral valve. You see the pressure vary, resulting in the opening and closing of the valve physically and on the echocardiogram of that model. When you adjust the chordal tension to tether the P2 segment to the posterior leaflet, the pressure you can generate goes down due to regurgitation. Here's another example of a patient-specific model of a patient with mitral regurgitation before repair. And here is the result after repair. This approach may be especially useful for designing valve repairs for populations where there is no good animal model, including hypoplastic left heart syndrome and complete atrioventricular canal. And as we recently demonstrated, for the tricuspid valve in a child with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. But while physical simulation and testing could be helpful for designing new repairs, it is likely to be too slow and laborious for routine use. SOX, whom we quote in the introduction, has demonstrated finite element modeling of the mitral valve from CT scans of ovine hearts. One can use this engineering tech, a technique to apply pressures to the valve models and examine the areas of high stress and the locations of potential failure, as well as test the effect of structural alterations to the valve shape and chordal structure. Put bluntly, this technique could be used to test new repairs in silico rather than on children. Unfortunately, these high resolution CT-based models are only possible in deceased animals or patients and not um, based on um, live 
imaging. However, SOX et al. have demonstrated that that level of resolution may not be necessary to make clinically useful insights. Here, they demonstrate reduction of the complexity of the chordal apparatus substantially, and the resulting leaflet stresses and characteristics are still quite similar to the CT model based on ground truth models. This is important. We can see some papillary muscle structure in 3D echocardiograms, but not the level of detail demonstrated in ex vivo CT scans. This suggests that we may be able to create 3D echocardiogram-based models in real patients, and those models may be of clinical utility. We are beginning to experiment with this, as shown in a hypoplastic left tricuspid valve, and in mitral valves, as shown here, both diagrammatically and in finite element models. Ultimately, the integration of these technologies could significantly inform the way we manage and intervene upon children with valve disease. However, many children have atrioventricular valve disease that cannot currently be repaired. Surgical valve replacement is possible, but the static valve will need to be replaced many times as the child grows. Folks in Boston, including Dr. Amani pioneered the idea of the implantation of a balloon expandable stent-based valve in the mitral position. One of the problems that can occur is that the part of the valve in the left ventricle can cause left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, or if the valve is too small, blood can leak around the valve. So we designed a way to put virtual devices into patient-specific 3D echocardiogram device models of children in order to test device fit. After the creation of heart models, one can quantify the size of the left ventricular outflow tract after um, implantation of various devices and configurations. And in a small series of patients in whom this modeling was retrospectively applied, those patients with actual left ventricular outflow tract obstruction were predicted from preoperative images to have smaller left ventricular outflow tract areas. This virtual valve placement can be challenging with traditional keyboard and mouse controls, so we've, we have been experimenting with and developing virtual reality. Here we test different valve lengths and positions to visually assess for left ventricular outflow tract obstruction after device insertion. Surgical expandable valves will be one indication for this modeling, but novel transcatheter atrioventricular valves can have the same challenges with outflow tract obstruction. Here we show simulated placement of a device in a moving echocardiogram of an adolescent with rheumatic valve disease to demonstrate potential application to transcatheter mitral valve replacement and planning of those procedures. And while we have focused on the atrioventricular valves, image-based planning of transcatheter pulmonary valves can benefit from these techniques as well. As shown here for self-expanding pulmonary valve in the RVOT. Stepping back, whether designing improved surgical valve repairs or future transcatheter interventions, the bottom line is that kids deserve better than guess and check. We think that multimodality image-based modeling will contribute to the advancement of precision medicine that will help us get it right the first time, both surgically and increasingly in transcatheter-based interventions. Ultimately, I hope these efforts begin to influence outcomes by providing, providing real value to our patients and help accelerate progress in the field by introducing reproducibility, augmenting the progression of an individual surgeon or interventionalist over time. I would like to thank those in my lab and our collaborators for their contributions to this work, as well as acknowledge our sources of funding. Thank you. Matt, a fantastic talk as always, and I think I, I've heard you give a version of this talk um, several times in the last several years, and I learn something different each time. Um, you know, it's, when you think about the evolution of technology for us, you know, as surgeons, we've gone from uh, basically operating blind, especially for congenital heart defects. I mean, think about how the original uh, open heart operations were not just guess and check, they were stop the heart, look inside, and, and see if you were right, uh, to what we consider to be sort of 21st century imaging right now. But as you're sort of implying, I think we're still back in two-dimensional um, calibration in our minds, whereas the fields of technology in, in different areas have gone 
purely into three dimensional. I really, I find as a surgeon, I find this really compelling. The um, so here's a question for you. So most, of, you know, a lot of our technology and kids uh, evolves out of the adult world because of the numbers that they have. Um, I would say that congenital heart surgeons as a whole, as a breed, um, are uh, egomaniacs. And so we look at the adult heart surgeons from whom we learned heart surgery, and we say, it's great that you can democratize a mitral valve repair, as I think the field has done actually quite well with a lot of different versions of annuloplasty rings, pretty straightforward approaches to um, uh, a logical way to look at valvar, subvalvar, leaflet apparatus. Um, but the question comes up is how applicable are those um, advances from adults to children? And I'll give you an example, which is that when I was in training, we had one of the most famous mitral valve surgeons in the world came as a guest speaker. And they presented after the, um, his, his talk, we had the, what we call the stump the chump session, right? Where you present all these uh, really difficult cases. And one of them was a, an adult with a repaired AV canal. And the surgeon looked at that and he said, well, the obvious answer is to put in a, a, a partial annuloplasty ring. And all the congenital heart surgeons in the back row just chuckled because we thought to ourselves, there's not really an annulus there. You know, the, the thought of, of um, just uh, kind of applying this, you know, the few therapies that we have onto congenital heart valves that may not conform to that, that same um, anatomy just seemed like a fallacy. So do you have thoughts on that about how, are there, where, where do we reach that limitation of ac applicability of adult therapies? I think in adult mitral valve disease, there are, there is a, a spectrum of pathologies which surgeons have gotten very good at treating. It's a relatively compared to congenital heart disease, homogeneous population. And so they have had time to empirically validate techniques through high volume um, at individual centers, individual practitioners. I think that they have pushed the field and are doing amazing things given that focus on a limited number of pathologies and um, have a great deal to contribute to pediatric valve disease. That said, as your uh, example shows, we are dealing with totally different substrates um, that are heterogeneous um, for which an individual surgeon may only see a particular type of lesion a several times in, in his or her career. And that is a very different situation. I think that uh, clearly there will be uh, input and, um, and benefit to getting the adult point of view, but it's going to require dedicated development, concentration, and focus. Uh, valves are difficult structures. They are ornate structures. They're a uh, suspension bridge um, between um, uh, the ventricle and, and the atria preventing that valve coming back. And uh, they are hard to model, but incredibly important as that uh, data in single ventricle um, patients that I, I had at the beginning of my talk shows as um, the data in complete atrioventricular canal uh, or, or your example shows. Uh, so we need to figure this out. It's gonna take teams, it's gonna take um, physicians clearly, but also engineers. It's gonna take adult physicians, pediatric physicians, and hopefully um, with humble application of each uh, individual's expertise, we're able to push uh, the field forward. I think in conversations with uh, Mo Nuri, who is um, coming to uh, direct the Valve Institute here, he said, you know, we have to make this more scientific. We have to make it more quantitative and not just be based on, on what um, he sees as a, uh, a surgeon uh, with the heart deflated, uh, with a limited point of view. Uh, so I think together, if we have um, uh, an attitude of, of teamwork and what each of us can, can bring uh, to push that goal forward, I think, uh, I, I think we will make head road, inroads. And headway. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I, the, the single ventricle valve part in particular, the tricuspid valve uh, as we think of it, uh, is so 
uh, it's fascinating in this sort of chicken egg notion, right? Is it is it that we you know for for years we thought well you get tricuspid regurg as a hypoplast because your ventricular function falls apart and those dilates, but then you know one begets the other begets the other. What I find as a surgeon uh, so fascinating about the work from your lab is that there may actually be a uh, I don't know about unique, but a characteristic structural abnormality that may predispose to that. And one question then comes up for us as surgeons, well, maybe, and we're probably far away from that at this point, but not so far away, maybe if you have some subvalvular anatomy that is unfavorable for tricuspid valve pathology, maybe those are the patients who should never get a SANO, for example, right? Because then we're adding on top of that the ventricular dysfunction of a hole in the ventricle and so forth. So. Uh, how, how do you feel, like how easy do you think it's gonna be for us to contextualize for these patients the chicken egg problem? And where, like how far do we have to get before we say it's time to do a prophylactic tricuspid valve repair uh, at the time of the glen, even if they don't have that, the, the tricuspid regurg isn't that bad because we know from the data that you showed that their survival is, is just dramatically impaired, potentially solely because of the tricuspid valve regurgitation. Very good question. I think that there are many different parameters on many different three-dimensional axes for the leaflets themselves, for the annulus, for the subvalvar apparatus. And until we have a way to reliably phenotype those structural characteristics, we will not be able to contextualize um, the repair to an individual patient. So as you know, that's something that my group is working very hard on, um, both uh, making basic tools and now using machine learning and other uh, image processing techniques such that you'll be able to phenotype any given valve more quickly. And then with techniques like statistical shape analysis, you can then project all those parameters for that individual into a bell curve on many different axes to figure out where they fit on all of those sides. And then once you have the ability to phenotype, then you can associate to outcomes, right, to ventricular performance, to tricuspid regurgitation, you can associate structure to genetics, but until you have phenotypes, you're really in the dark ages. So. That I think is the first part. And then once you have the ability to contextualize that individual within that spectrum, then you have an idea of what you need to fix. And when you can do that, and you have specific types of interventions to rectify or palliate um, specific uh, structural deviations from the, the normal or the functional valve, then I think you have a very precise way for a surgeon to, to figure out what interventions are likely to work. And in, when we first start, that will probably be putting it in a pulse simulator or doing finite element analysis. If I pull that papillary muscle over a bit, is that gonna help me? Is that going to reduce stress on the leaflets? Is that reduce regurgitation in that model? But it's gonna be a long road uh, the, the materials that we have for doing simulation are, are not tissue, they are not live, um, and finite element modeling is only as good as the uh, material properties that you can put in. So this is a hard problem, it's going to take a while, but I believe that we're starting to get to the point where we can start to associate those structural phenotypes to dysfunction and characterize that individual within that bell curve and, uh, and bring meaningful information uh, that will augment the ability of an individual surgeon to have a successful repair. So let's talk a little bit about materials. So in the New York Times this morning, uh, there was an obituary for William Gore who helped develop the Gore product. And it's, it's actually, it's a great read if you have a chance. It turns out that the original uh, um, inception of the Gore um, PTFE was that he was looking for better plumber's tape, you know, the stuff that you stick around, that, that like stretchy stuff, that white stuff you put around the threads of a, of a shower head. And in the process of developing a, a newer and a better tape, they developed PTFE that then went into jackets and it went into, you know, uh, 
TTFE graphs that we use in the operating room and all the you know, myriad of uh, applications. So uh, when we think about materials, maybe not materials for the operating room, because I feel like there's this whole arc of stem cells and you know, better than, that makes things that are better than glutaraldehyde treated pericardium. But for this, your purposes, the experimental, are there, tech, are there um, other industries or technology that we should be just broadening our scope to think about? Like, should we think about plumber's tape as the, as the source of uh, one of these, uh, these leaflet uh, uh, simulators? I think that uh, there's definitely a spectrum there. We've compared uh, numerous uh, materials, both directly 3D printing. We didn't want to be limited by the materials uh, that current 3D printers can output. So then we made molds um, where you can put any material you want there. And I think this is where um, some humility as, as we go through this process and we look to others, we ask these questions to other engineers, we ask these questions to uh, tissue engineering scientists. When can we get to the point where we have um, not silicone or not some other synthetic material, but actual uh, valve leaflet material in there and cords that are more similar to actual um, uh, actual human, can we grow valves uh, from stem cells? Uh, there's work, as you know, where they have basically reconstructed hearts on, um, uh, on uh, scaffolding of uh, tris dissolved uh, um, uh, cadaveric hearts. So can we start to do that with uh, valves? So I, I think uh, we'll have to see, and we are open to ideas uh, from other areas, um, aerospace, stem cell, tissue engineering. I think the, what I have learned in my uh, time running a lab is that you welcome all expertise when you really want to solve a difficult problem. And uh, this is a difficult but critically important problem to our population. Okay, so I have a 30,000 foot view question. So. I, I appreciate very much your comments about humility, uh, because I think, and as you're pointing out, Muhammad Nuri, our, our incoming surgeon, probably is the embodiment of humility within a surgeon. Uh, one of the things that is unfortunate in the cardiac surgery field is that once you become a master valve surgeon, it becomes this uh, cult of the surgeon of the artist, right? That you go to that one person who has that ability, innate or learned, to transform both two-dimensional images, three-dimensional images, what they see, what their hands do, and how they think the, the, the valve creation is gonna work. And in some ways, what you're positing here in a very compelling way is that it takes a little bit of the art out and infuses maybe a little bit more of the science. And one could make the argument that that actually makes it more reproducible across the world, right? That in theory, if you're really to help the most children over the time, the best thing to do to democratize the procedure is to make it somehow uh, not about the artistry, but more about the logic, if you will. So as you look at the technology that you've created and that you will continue to create, whether you're across town in Philadelphia, whether you're across the country, whether you're across the world in Tanzania, how would a surgeon in Tanzania be able to access this wealth of imaging? You know, they, the, the many would say, well, we're in a unique position here because we have all the smarts and the people and technology and the money uh, to be able to do this for an individual patient, but how does that help little Johnny in Tanzania who just has a two-dimensional echo? Do you, can you foresee, if you look into the 30,000-foot view, like how we can make this more accessible to everyone? So I would take a step back and I would say that while we are trying to create tools that add quantitative reasoning, logic, structure-based decision-making to this process, there will always be an art because that structure, that thinking um, will always need to be transformed into a functional outcome for an individual child. That said, I think that if we take a more quantitative approach and structure-based approach, we'll be able to make any individual surgeon's ability to provide a very high level repair uh, more probable. So to your question, I, I think that we have thought about this a lot and 
Um, one aspect, for example, we've been working hard on machine learning to uh, make it easier to create these valve models. Currently, a research assistant trained for three to six months can make one in a couple of hours, right? But that's not a technology that's accessible to most people. And so if you have enough of these models, you can then train a machine algorithm to do it and get it down to five or six seconds. And then that becomes clinically viable. And while they may not have the uh, technological capability to train a machine learning algorithm, there's two aspects to machine learning, um, what's called training and inference. And it's akin to learning uh, to kick um, a, a soccer ball, it may take a child a, a lot of steps and a lot of time to get to the point um, where they can uh, do a Pele level bicycle kick, but uh, an elite soccer player can do that on command because they've been trained forever. So in machine learning uh, space, that means you can train these algorithms on huge computers over days or weeks, but then inference will run on your phone. So I think that um, that's an example of how we may be able to help. You have a server, or maybe they don't even have uh, that level, but they submit their echocardiogram to a server on the web. We're able to provide models and insight and quantification and provide um, uh, contextualizing information across those different aspects of the valve that they can then use uh, to repair uh, it uh, in a totally different country. Um, most of the software, stepping back another layer that we build, we release uh, open source. So when we have published our work, um, we believe that others uh, can build on what we've done. That's another aspect of what um, we're looking to contribute so that uh, people in other countries and other sites can continue to push uh, the field forward. Well, you know, what some people probably don't know, uh, I, you and I, apart from sharing an operating room in common and many patients in common, we also share in common that we were, uh, we both spent some time in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. And uh, your Pele analogy is very apt. Um, and I don't know if you still follow them, but one of the things that and I'm not a big sports fan, but they tell me one of the great things about Russell Wilson, who was a big um, uh, advocate at Seattle Children's, is that he was uh, one of these uh, unique athletes because he, in the beginning, was apparently as good at football as he was at baseball. And it was really almost like a tug of war, which one he was going to pursue as his, as his professional career. And there's actually a point a few years ago where he actually thought about, I think, going back and taking up baseball, which is sort of remarkable. I think of you as one of these kind of people because – how, how one's journey ends up to be, uh, you know, um, working in these related but pretty different domains of anesthesiology and cardiology is pretty interesting. So how, how did that happen? Were you, did you have a Russell Wilson moment where they said you have to choose or were you, uh, did you just keep going in parallel and thinking you, you could do it even though no one else had ever done it? So I... I had a really hard time figuring out what I was going to do. And really the only constant for me was that I knew I wanted to walk into a, into a kid's hospital. And that had particular meaning to me for, for various reasons. One of my best friends uh, growing up uh, spent a lot of time at Seattle Children's where I grew up. and. Um, he had uh, leukemia and eventually succumbed to that, but I was always struck by the physicians and the nurses there. And then I, another poll, my father, when, when he was young, was riding his bike, or not so young, but in his 40s when I was in college, was struck by a car with others and was at the, the trauma unit at Harborview um, for months, and uh, I got to know some of those neurosurgeons, and after that, I'm like, I'm going to be a pediatric neurosurgeon, right? So I, I went through that. I went through college. I went through med school. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do, and it spent, you know, probably way too much time asking people uh, how I was going to be able to contribute um, 
And ultimately, I, I trained through pediatrics, uh, but I wanted more hands-on. I went and did anesthesia, and thinking I was going to do pediatric anesthesia. And while in pediatric anesthesia, I was exposed to imaging through adult cardiac anesthesia and said, oh, this would be awesome. I'll do um, anesthesia and you know, be in the game and I'll do imaging and be able to uh, guide these procedures. And then people said, oh, yeah, in, in pediatrics, the anesthesiologist does not do the imaging. So then... Uh, I thought, okay, maybe I'll do a, a cardiology fellowship while in cardiology. Uh, you know, maybe I should do EP, maybe I should do cath. And uh, uh, I, it was hard. And uh, you're older and you have a family and uh, your, your wife uh, supports you through, through all of that. And uh, ultimately, I think I just wanted to find a way to contribute that utilized some of my skills. And um, it wasn't clear when I finished training that a place would support uh, that role. Like, why would you want someone to do two things if they can be better at one thing? Why don't we hire two people? And from my perspective, there, there was some benefit to having the combination, but I had to convince people. So then I had trained you know, 12 years and wasn't sure I'd have a job. And uh, to really the credit of uh, Jim Steven, Frank McGowan, at that time, Bill Greeley, they supported my notion and my vision. And, uh, and they're the reason I came to CHOP. So... Um, it's worked because how do you get these images of kids who are rowdy and run around? Well, you do the imaging in the OR after you've put a breathing tube in, and that's hard to do if you're not comfortable with the OR environment, if you don't have rapport with the OR nurses. And so we've built a, a system as a result of my combined training that leverages the best of what I can do, and I, I don't think I'm competing with the, the Dave Goldbergs or the, or the uh, Susan Nicholsons directly. While I function in, in their realms, I have my own um, place to contribute and my own place uh, to try and push the field forward uh, where I have a, a unique uh, contribution or at least hope that I do. So I'm very thankful to um, to the people who supported that notion and who continue uh, to support it. Um, I'm now even more fragmented between anesthesia research and, uh, and imaging. And I think the day that I'm not able to do each of those at a level that I feel is elite, then I hope someone tells me that. So I, uh, I let someone else uh, take on that role. So tell me a little bit about bicycle riding. You were, your father's injury apparently didn't stop you from wanting to commute every day on a bicycle, which is a common thing in Seattle, and it's a very uncommon, some would argue, unhealthy thing in Philadelphia. So how do you persist, or why do you persist? I think for me, a bicycle is freedom, and, uh, and it's a buffer. It's guaranteed workout. It's a buffer between home and work. From a practical perspective, it's the same amount of time each way, no matter what time of day. And uh, it's something that I enjoy. I, outside of commuting, my family rides mountain bikes, and um, we like to do a lot of the downhill biking. And my children, like, like I think most fathers, uh, make drawings and paintings. And some of my favorites, uh, my eldest, uh, a few years ago, drew a picture of him uh, riding his bike. And the caption at the top was, I feel peaceful when I ride my bike. I think that uh, I have that same sentiment. Um, my eldest is a little more of a fireball. And uh, his, uh, 
latest uh, drawing of what he did this summer was the picture of him at the top of a mountain and uh, him riding down. And uh, that's what he uh, envisions his summer as like. So it's a family affair. My, my wife um, didn't grow up riding bikes, but is game for anything and uh, does the downhill and the biking with us and supports that. Uh, we're hoping to get over to the Philly Pump Track, which is a BMX track in, in um, West Philly uh, this afternoon for their uh, first open day in COVID. So <coughs> we, uh, I think you gotta live the day. You find the things that are, uh, that are fun for you and that uh, keep you grounded and give you some buffer from uh, the intensity and um, weight of what we do on a daily basis. And for me, uh, a bicycle encapsulates much of that. Maybe just in wrapping up, I think, um, you know, one thing about when you're talking about your, your career pathway, you know, the, um, the operating room, or I should say the whole period, pre-op operating room, peri-op, post-op home, that arc is, um, you know, I often say to parents, the surgeons are the first two minutes on that clock, right? The other 58 minutes, is everything else. It's anesthesia, it's critical care, it's the nurses, it's you know social work, it's the cardiologists who are taking care of you afterwards. You need to have that perfect operation in the first two minutes, but the other 58 are probably arguably as important, if not more important. And so did you have a sense as you were training that you wanted to be in a field that had sort of team sport as its own sort of uh, um, foundation? Uh, because some of these things that you're talking about, I mean, I suppose pediatric surgery has a little, or pediatric anesthesia has a little bit of that, but not quite to the same extent that like a, a cardiac center does. So I don't know if that helped change your course as you thought about your specialty. I think to do anything really hard requires a team. That's true in, in the military, that's true in many aspects of life. And kids, Cardiac medicine is hard. The stakes are high, the highest. And um, to be part of a team that does that well is um, a big part of what keeps me coming to work. We talked uh, a little bit about um, this concept of the handoff. There's a oil painting by a fellow who is the year ahead of me in anesthesia where there's a mother and a father handing their uh, toddler, maybe six month old uh, child to an anesthesiologist. And we do that every day, but when they hand their child to us, they're handing that child to a team. And there's an implicit understanding that we're as a team going to do everything we can to facilitate the best outcome for that child. And there's other specialties in anesthesia where they hand a child off, but very few where the stakes are as high or perhaps the risks are as high. And so um, right now I enjoy being part of a team that contributes to that, walking into a kid's hospital and uh, being part of that, that process. Well, we enjoy having you here with us. So thank you again for a great talk. Thanks for the chat afterwards. And um, back to you, Jack Reichick. And thank you all for your attention and uh, for listening to this, this fantastic talk and, uh, and life lessons and life advice. Uh, we are very much interested in your feedback. And we'd love to hear questions concerning our content that you've heard as well as suggestions for additional topics that would be of interest to have reviewed in depth and discussed. In order to communicate with us, we have a dedicated email address. It's chopheartalks at email.chop.edu. We'd appreciate hearing from you. We'd love to hear your ideas and suggestions. Thanks so much for your attention.